This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. Being happy is great. Moments of joy are great. But being whole and complete is the real life goal. Visit BetterHelp.com super and get on your journey to finding wholeness. Hey, brother. OK, not going to lie. Ben and I have been super hyped about Avatar 2 The Way of Water. Like we have not been able to stop talking about it. And I'm so excited to actually be making a video about it for you guys. So today we're going to dive into probably the biggest question everyone has walking out of the movie, because it's the one big question that sort of goes unresolved, which is, who is Kiri's father? It's a mystery the characters themselves even sort of like prod at inside of the story, giving us the impression that it's going to be like a really big deal when we finally find out who it is. And the mystery gets even deeper when you consider the fact that Kiri's character is the result of an unexpected pregnancy from an unused avatar body from the character Grace back in the first movie played by Sigourney Weaver, who, if you will recall, uh, died in the first movie. Like they tried to do this whole ceremony where they transferred her consciousness from her human body into her avatar, but from what we saw, it didn't look like it worked. Especially since they tried to do the exact same thing later in the movie for Jake, and it, uh, it, it definitely does work. So today, we are going to get to the bottom of this. How did Kiri come to be? What is up with her weird relationship with Awa? And who is her father? All right, who is Kiri's father? I think a good starting point is just to recap everything we learn after Jake's exposition dump at the start of the movie. If you will recall, in the first Avatar movie, Grace Augustine's body is mortally wounded, but there is an outside chance that they can save her. Since Grace has been such an avid supporter of the Na'vi and their entire culture, they try to perform a ceremony that will transfer her consciousness from her human body into her Na'vi avatar body. Now, in a lot of ways, they're just showing you this the first time because it's a setup for later in the movie when they try the same thing with Jake and it actually does work. With Grace's scene really setting the tone for how much of a long shot this procedure really is and in fact we see hers be unsuccessful. Or is it? The sort of weird takeaway from it though is that her avatar body is so perfectly healthy and usable, there's just no longer a human available to pilot the avatar body. Which as a reminder, it's typically a very one-to-one -one situation for what human can pilot which avatar body. Jake himself is only selected to pilot the avatar body he's in because he is actually an identical twin brother and his brother died, so they had to come get Jake instead. But because they're identical twins, he has such similar genetic coding that he's actually able to stay pilot the avatar. But for Grace, there's no one who can really step in. So her body is really just left in stasis where they suddenly discover that to their surprise, she's pregnant, which is like wild when you consider what's happening. Like you have a perfectly healthy body capable of doing alive things. You just don't have like a mind capable of controlling it and making it do things. And yet it is still obviously quite capable of growing a new Navi child Kiri. The twist is that while Grace's avatar body is pregnant, nobody comes forward to claim themselves as the father, leaving the identity of the father a complete mystery. But while they're sorting that out, in the meantime, Jake and Natiri adopt Kiri into their own family. But this makes Kiri's existence extremely unusual, as she is the only Na'vi ever born from an avatar mother. I guess Jake is in a somewhat similar situation. I mean, obviously he started as human and then becomes Na'vi and does produce children. But the big difference with Jake is that when they perform the big ceremony on him at the end, it works. Like he effectively becomes a Na'vi. But who Kiri's father is, is pointed out several times in the movie as being a big mystery and it goes unresolved, which leads us to believe that when it is finally revealed who it is, it is going to be a really big deal. It's also pretty obvious from the treatment her character is getting in this movie, The Way of Water, that her character in particular is going to be massively important and probably capable of some pretty wild stuff. I mean, for example, even though she's She's not the main character in this movie, or even the main kid we're following in this movie, it's still Kiri who gets the nice big close up of her face on all of the movie posters. I don't know. Feels important. On top of that, more in universe, there's also her budding relationship with Spider, who she actually shares a lot in common with. 
with. Kiri is the Navi child of a human mother, while Spider is the human child of a now Navi man, AKA Colonel Quaritch. And these two characters in particular are absolutely supposed to represent the coming together of the Navi and human cultures, which is important because while the big battles are of course really fun to watch, it is almost definitely the case that this series ends with the two different races coming together in harmony. For one, going back to Jake's exposition dump, it is revealed almost immediately that the planet Earth is dying and that they have chosen Pandora to be the new homeworld for humans. So like it or not, tons more humans are going to be arriving on Pandora. Which I guess, does that mean they're like every human is gonna have to wear one of those face mask things like for their entire life from the moment they're born? I guess. Or else prediction, science solved this by the time of the next movie and they all just have like totally unnoticeable nose insertion things. It's like, oh yeah, we can breathe now. It's fine, don't worry about it. Yay, science. But the fact that a huge portion of Earth's population is coming to Pandora is a big deal because whilst all the humans there right now are typically involved in either military or mining or like construction of infrastructure, eventually it's just gonna be regular civilians who don't have any beef with the Navi and who just want somewhere to to live. They will genuinely just be refugees on a new planet looking for safe harbor. Which when you take a step back is exactly what Jake and his family are doing in this movie. But my point is, while all the humans there so far haven't been great, humanity dying off as a whole is something I don't think even Jake would want. Like that's still a net loss overall. But if the earth is dying, then they do need somewhere to go. And it looks like they've already decided on Pandora. So if they're going to survive, they're ultimately all gonna have to find a way to get along. Which brings us back to Kiri and her much larger role of being the bridge between the two worlds. Because Kiri is not just unique in how she was brought into this world, but also what she can do in this world and her like astonishing relationship with nature. For example, when she first enters the water, she has like a near transformative experience upon which she claims she can now feel the heartbeat of Awa, which she describes as mighty. Then while learning the way of water, she realizes she can control the flow and direction of different schools of fish, something even the queen of the water tribe is taken aback by like, whoa, what are you doing there? Then later she takes it even a step further and just sort of like controls different large sea anemone looking creatures to just reach out and grab enemy ships. Something the other water tribe members are like, whoa, what are you doing? Then when she connects with the underwater spirit tree, she ends up having a seizure when she asks, who her father is, which if you ask me is just this like tricky mechanism the movie is doing to make sure that we postpone Kiri getting the answer to the question, who is her father? Because they have Norm fly in and explain to Jake that if she does this again, she might die. So definitely don't do that again. All right guys, now we need to take a brief pause to give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. There's nothing better than the awe sparked by the unexpected. And that's exactly what the curators over at Bespoke Post have done with their winter lineup of a box of awesome collections. And if you watch the show for a while, you've probably already heard me sing Bespoke Post's praises before because each month they partner with a variety of small businesses to bring you the coolest goods and gifts. Like this winter, you might want to pick up the Hibernate box, which comes with these amazing snuggly slippers. Or you might want to perfect your storage situation with this awesome little desktop swivel box. Look at this, what? I use this on my desk all the time. I love it. It also came with this really cool pen. The beauty of it is that whatever you're into, they've got you covered. They even have a quiz for you over at boxofawesome.com that will help you select just the right box for you. Personally, I would also recommend the Flame Box. Ben has one of these at his house. Whenever I'm there, he's got it like going in the living room and it makes the whole house feel so cozy. The Spoke Post releases new boxes every month across a variety of categories. And even though each box is valued at about $70, you're only paying a fraction of that. Plus with each box of awesome, you're supporting a small business. Plain and simple. It's free to sign up and you can skip a month or cancel at any time. So you get 20% off your first monthly box when you head to boxofawesome.com and use the promo code SUPER at checkout. One more time, that's boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER at checkout for 20% off your first monthly box. Boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER, link in the description down below. But hey, while he's here, let's talk about Norm because in universe, it sort of feels like he's the presumed father. 
Joker. Like they even sit around and joke about it, pointing out that he's always around in all of Grace's video logs. Like that's oh, definitely Norm, right? But do not be fooled by this. It is not Norm. Norm is just a red herring. Her real father is way more impressive than Norm, which like, no offense, Norm, I love you, pal. You're a great dude. Yes. But honestly, father feels like the wrong word altogether because typically this entity is referred to as the all mother or the great mother because Kiri's other parent is none other than Awa. Yes, Awa, the literal goddess of Pandora herself, who is now also walking around in another form as Kiri. Here's what happened. If we go back to Grace's death ceremony where they're trying to transfer her consciousness from one body to another, it's almost surprising that it doesn't work. Because by all accounts, all of the roots and bioluminescence and spirits and whatever else is going on there seem to be doing what is requested of them. They even form this like big rope at the back of Grace's head. And when it's over, she even says, I'm with her, She's real. And Grace is of course referring to Awa in this moment. That's who's real. But what's interesting is if you back it up of a couple of minutes and listen to what Moat is actually requesting of Awa during the ceremony, here's what she says. Take the spirit into you and breathe her back to us. Let her walk among us as one of the people. It sounds like what she's saying is take Grace's spirit into you and breathe Grace back to us and allow her to walk around in a Navi body. But it seems like what actually happened is Awa took Grace's spirit and breathed Awa back into her body to walk around among them. Which almost sounds like a grammatical error on Awa's part, doesn't it? Like I said her, not you. And yet it's not because Awa is able to exist as herself and also as the living being Kiri. And if that sounds like super familiar, like, I don't know, God and Jesus, that is because that is the exact parallel they are going for here. I mean, seriously, to go with it, there's a virgin birth, an immaculate conception. Kiri is quite literally delivered through grace. She is graced to the Navi, which I agree, it's a little on the nose, but it still works. And uh, oh, Merry Christmas, by the way. Who thought this was a Christmas movie? Effectively, what this means though, is that while we saw Kiri control a few like underwater plants and schools of fish in this movie, that power is going to scale up globally at some point. Like it would not surprise me if in the third or fourth or fifth movie, Kiri is capable of controlling like the entire planet at once. Which naturally having such power and her being like such an obvious physical representation of the harmony between humans and Navi is definitely going to make her the target of somebody down the line. Which personally I think will help the plot revolve specifically around protecting Kiri and keep the Sully family right at the middle of everything. And while I doubt you need further confirmation at this point, I think there is another thing that is very much worth pointing out. It happens fairly early in the movie while Kiri is napping and enjoying the feeling of the grass beneath her when suddenly a swarm of wood sprites comes and lands on her. And the wood sprites, as we know, are actually seeds from the Tree of Souls and are considered incredibly pure and sacred by the Na'vi. And where they come to land and rest is often considered a sign from Awa herself to the Na'vi. For example, in the first movie, one first lands on the end of Natiri's bow, stopping her from killing Jake right then and there in that moment. And then just a few minutes later, a huge swarm of them land on him as well, marking him as pure of heart. And at this point, you might be thinking like, well, Jake comes back to life too, and he was also chosen by the wood sprites. Does that make him some sort of deity as well? But no, Kiri represents more harmony on the planet as a whole, while Jake represents the bridge that will lead to harmony. I mean, not for nothing, but he is literally standing on a bridge when this happens. Again, it's a little on the nose, but very effective. But otherwise, there is still a fairly important difference between these two scenes with the wood sprites, namely that when it happens to Jake, there is an audience. Natiri is able to witness it happening and interpret it as a sign, which leads to Jake eventually being accepted into the camp. Their arrival for Jake serves an absolute purpose. With Kiri, nobody is watching. There is no audience. She's not even awake. They just arrive and land on her because she is truly pure of heart, because she is Awa.
In the end, it seems like Awa already sort of knows what's coming for the planet and what's best for the planet. And what's best for the planet seems like it's going to be harmony between the Navi and the humans. It's just gonna be a really exciting ride seeing them get there. But there you go, guys. That's our explanation for where Kiri came from. If you want to see some more Avatar content from us, you can check out our review of The Way of Water right here. And if you want to see more Avatar theories from us, please leave a like on this video to let us know or leave us a comment down below. It really helps us decide what we're going to talk about in the future. I had a blast diving into this movie, and I cannot wait to go see the movie again. Anyway, hope you've had an awesome year. Happy holidays. Happy New Year's. We'll see you next time. Ben, I will see you in another life, brother.